Thank you. Um, just to give you a really quick rundown of me, um, I grew up here in Tassie, grew up on the northwest coast and uh, feel very connected to this place. And then I went to Melbourne uh, for like 25 years. Um, and then I moved back to look after family. So I now have our kids and a lot of my sister's kids. Um, and just um, as, as much as I'm reminded again of the lack of services in Tassie, uh, I'm also reminded of how beautiful this place is. And, um, you know, we're on uh, very close to uh, the Tama River or Kanamaluka, which is the, the coming together of three important Indigenous um, groups. And one of the things that I often wonder to myself is why we are not learning more from um, Aboriginal people about actually connecting to the land, especially when we live in Tassie, um, and being in harmony with, you know, we're on this river that converges and um, I think as much as there are all these limitations, I also think there's something very magic about Tassie and we can learn a lot from, I don't know, the natural land that we have here. Um, I am not doing a whole lot of clinical work anymore, but I worked in uh, oncology at St Vincent's Hospital for about 30 years, um, and mostly with uh, women with breast cancer. Um, sorry, people with breast cancer. We're, we're getting that. We're getting better and better at that. Um, and now I work for. I still work for St Vincent's, so from a distance. Um, doing some of their policy work, and I'm now working at UTAS in the Centre for Rural Health. And, you know, Tasmania, if you look at how we define um, parts of Australia, um, there is metropolitan, rural, regional. 70% of Tasmania is considered rural, regional. Um, and I think we have all of the struggles that all rural and regional places have, but we're on this island. Um, where I'm happy to say um, out loud, even though it might not be a UTAS thing, you know, we just don't have the kind of healthcare that we should have. Um, and we have a real opportunity to, because it's an island. Um, so anyway, I don't want to start with um, putting that, but I'm, I'm glad to be in uh, the university part of that at the moment, because we're starting to look at, okay, guys, <laughs> we actually need better, better supports and, um, to not have the oldest, sickest, uh, most under-resourced population in this country, and the second largest Aboriginal group per capita in this country, aside from the Northern Territory, and where are we seeing any um, voice and supports from, um, with and from um, those groups? So anyway, a whole lot of things could change. Um, but I feel really blessed to be here uh, today. And what I want to do is talk about, I guess, two broad things. One is how I understand the experience of having a breast cancer diagnosis and the adjustment, um, fully accepting that I've never had breast cancer, but I've sat with hundreds of people that have, and this is what I hear. So I want to kind of put a psychological understanding, because I think I know with myself when I understand what's happening, even if it's a hard thing, it's so much easier. So I want to do a bit of that and then come up with a couple of things that we, we know are helping um, to manage some of the uncertainty and some of the difficulty. Um, so I'll just um, go through and some of this, I'm hoping a lot of this resonates with you, but it's okay if it doesn't. And I'll be really interested for you to say, you know what, that actually wasn't my experience because that's important as well. Okay. Um, oh, okay, it's there. That's really cool. Okay. <laughs> um, oh. That's you going back. Okay. Oh, there you go. Yep. I have a PhD, but I can't actually use a, one of these. <laughs> you should try the app. That's <laughs> touche. Touche. Um, okay. So, um, this quote you never know uh, how strong you'll be until being strong is your only choice. You know, one of the things that you know, you often hear, gosh, she's so wonderful, or he's, gosh, he's amazing, he's coping really well. Um, and you know what? Wouldn't it be good if you'd had a choice? 
we just do it because we have to. And yes, we're amazing when we can face things, but it doesn't mean that uh, we necessarily want to go, oh, thanks, because you know we haven't actually had a choice. Having said that, I am constantly overwhelmed by the incredible spirit and strength that people have to get more bad news and pull themselves back up and, um, and have things that they struggle with but still be able to say, that's an incredible tree. Um, a, that human spirit thing has always really impacted on me. Um, Emily McDowell is a woman who makes um, these cards um, that are a bit more realistic, and she's, um, you can look her up on emilymcdowell.com. Um, this one says, I promise to uh, never refer, it's, it's, it's actually not the biggest um, screen back there, um, to your illness as a journey unless someone um, uh, buys you a cruise. Um, I'm not going to talk about this as a journey, but I do believe that the experience of going from someone who um, doesn't have breast cancer or someone who loves someone who doesn't have breast cancer and then being someone with breast cancer or loving someone with breast cancer um, is a transition. It's, it's the same transition, same concept as when we, we have any big change in our life. Um, and when we're going through that change, it's really uncomfortable because we like to things to be in control and we like to know what's going to happen tomorrow. So it's a really uncomfortable place to be. And that's the, the time when I think we should be doing more support and more help about what that means. So um, I'm going to put a few questions up here and I'll read them from here. Um, not for you to answer at the moment, but because it's, I think what's useful is to stop every now and then and just check in with yourself and what are the big areas that you might want to think about. Um, so what's been the worst thing and the most traumatic? Now that might sound like a really obvious question. You might go, well, I got a cancer diagnosis or my partner got a cancer diagnosis. But actually, if we hone it down, it's, off, it's often quite specific things. It's, you know, that work has been difficult or that I had to talk to the kids or... So actually defining that is useful. Um, how has this changed your plans? How has this changed your body? How has this changed how you see yourself? We could do a whole session on that. Who were you before this happened? Who are you now? What have you learnt about yourself? What do you want back? What do you want to change? Um, how much sorry, support do you feel you've had or you have? What are you hopeful for? Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. <coughs> How is your partner, if you have a partner? How are your kids, if you have kids or you have children in your life? Um, what is meaningful in your life and how can you have more of that? I'm going to talk a bit more about that later. And do you know, do you know where to get help? Um, we want you to leave here knowing some things about where to get help if you, if you feel like you need to. Okay, just ponder those. So. Again, I use this metaphor of a bridge all the time, that we're crossing from what life was before and what it is now and that bit in between. Um, and the support we need to be able to adjust to that. This is a painting of a blind woman crossing a bridge, which I'm sure it feels like that at times. You just, you know, you're on this um, bridge but you don't really know where you're heading. Um, or it's like, you know, going down a road, but, um, for the mainlanders in the room, they won't know where this is. Um, but uh, this is Jacob's Ladder, for those of you who I assume most of you know. I think this looks a much more like what the, what the experience of this road is that we're going on. Um, and my experience of Jacob's Ladder, so just, I shouldn't make assumptions, um, which is the road up to Mount Barrow where you go skiing. So not only is it like this, um, but it's one lane. And so if you are driving and someone's coming towards you, you have to reverse back to the corner so that you can let a car pass in the snow. Why? Seriously. So as a child, I remember going up there thinking, what are my parents doing? Then I went up when I was like a young, you know, my late teens, and um, the guys in the car thought it would be really funny to like 
rock the car as we went up. And now I tend to not go up it. It just, it scares the hell out of me. Um, but I think Jacob's Ladder is probably some more, somewhat more of what the experience is like. And there's so much in your head to process um, questions, the impact on other people, decisions, just all that stuff that goes on. And then there are the comments that we get from other people. Um, this one says, I'm so sorry you're sick. I want you to know that I'll never be the one to sell you treatments that I found on the internet, I'm paraphrasing. Um, I think one of the burdens we carry is everyone's really stupid responses and things that people say. And, you know, often I think people say those things because they want it to be better for you. It comes from a place of caring. And if you are in a generous mood, you can say, look, thanks for that information. Put it somewhere else. Um, if it feels like, you know what, you actually don't have any idea where I'm at, then, you know, you can say that. But there's a lot of those comments that come. There's this message that you're not allowed to have any negative thoughts. And it can be either specifically someone says to you, no, no, you're not allowed to think that way, can't think that way. Or it can be really subtle of like, um, oh, but there's another, there's another thing that we could do, or I don't know, just shutting you down when you're wanting to talk about it. If you have an experience that turns your life upside down, there are going to be times when the most normal thing for you to feel is overwhelmed by that. And you might be worried, and that might be considered a negative thought. Just adjustment. It's just adjusting to information that you've got. The most normal thing in the world. And it won't stay that way, and it won't mean that you do, don't do as well um, with treatments. Um, it is just adjusting, and it, it puts such an extra burden on people to feel like, this very normal response I'm having is not okay. Or, I know it's real for me, but I'm not allowed to say it to anyone, because everyone around me is going, please don't say you're worried too, because we're hoping you're just gonna be okay. So, this idea that we've gotta have positive vibes all the time. Positive vibes are great, we need a balance, but um, there are times when you're allowed to not have them. And then there's this. <coughs> but you look so good. Oh, wow, you're looking really good. Like it counter, you know, it takes away from any of the other stuff that's going on in your life. Again, it can be coming from a place of um, generosity. It can be a very, it can actually be people going, wow, you're looking really good, even though I know that you're going through a whole lot. Um, but it, it's not easy to hear, I think. Um, this is what I hear back all the time. So this is a really delicate walk delicate balance between wanting to have hope and absolutely having hope, and gosh, early stage breast cancer, there's a lot of hope, lots of treatment options, lots of things that can be done. Um, but still acknowledging all the chaos and the change and the fear and all that stuff, and it's like this balancing act. And that's normal. That's the normal response, is that we have, you know, some days we're like, can't do this, other days we're like, gee, I didn't realise how loved I was. And, you know, we go up Jacob's ladder. I was involved with a study, and um, I'm, these slides I've pretty much used for the last 20 years. Um, Mandy Forteeth has heard me talk about this for many times, probably. Um, but it still remains, I think, a really important concept. So what was happening was that I was Working in the oncology unit, we were treating a lot of women with early stage breast cancer. They were um, going through their treatment amazingly well, coping, coming in, having treatment, juggling the kids, juggling whatever. And then um, they would finish treatment and then there would be a period of time they'd come in to see the doctor for a checkup, and they would say, I can't stop crying. <coughs> and they'd get referred to me. It's a really common thing. And we'd all say, gosh, they coped so well during treatment, why are they, you know? So we decided to do this study. And really it was that we decided to sit down and go, can you tell us, um, which is what this was. We sat down with um, a number of people that had had um, early stage breast cancer, finished treatment, 
were on the other side of that period, um, survivorship period, if you like, and we said, tell us what the experience was like. And we also asked their partners. So the first thing that they told us was that there were these three phases they went through. And the first one was the diagnosis phase. So they went from being a well person to suddenly a cancer patient, whatever that meant. This, you know, overnight, suddenly you have this different label. Um, and it wasn't kind of considered that much at the time, and we learned that's, that's what trauma is all about. But actually looking back on it, it was the most horrible shock. They could talk about how that felt when you get bad news and you just go, oh my God, and your body feels cold and it's just a horrible feeling. Um, feeling of real be bewilderment. That the adjustment task during that time was like managing that shock and making a whole lot of treatment decisions and decisions about work and decisions about um, life while you started treatment. Right at the time when we would say you shouldn't make any decisions. So you shouldn't make decisions when you're shocked, but you have no choice um, when we're talking about a cancer diagnosis. Um, and managing all the people around you. And the coping strategy was actually avoiding thinking about all the other stuff. So someone once... Um, said to me, it was like, you know how a racing horse has blinkers? It was like, I've just got to focus here. I'm aware that um, my mum's crying all the time. I'm aware that my partner is not managing or, you know, whoever is happening, or I'm aware that maybe I'm going to lose my job. I can't think about it. I actually have to just get treatment. So there's this avoidance as a really helpful coping strategy um, to get you through. Um, so I've got some quotes from that original study, and I'll read them. So one woman said, um, and she was a woman, that's not me generalising, <laughs> um, it was one of those moments that will live on in life. It's scary. I hope I never have that moment again when she tells me it's cancer. And another one said that she described the scene like a photographic still, like a photograph, the crying, the feeling of tears. Mum was at the end of the bed and she burst out crying and ran. So people often would talk about, it's like I'm watching myself in a movie. It's like I have separated from this experience and I'm watching this nightmare that's actually in my life. Then they got into treatment. So then there was this whole treatment phase and obviously that can be anything from um, surgery to chemotherapy to surgery, chemotherapy, radiotherapy. It can be at different experiences for different people. But um, there was a sense that the experience was, of, was just about just getting through. I just have to get through this treatment. Um, with what I would really strongly say was probably psychological and physical trauma. I would happily use that term now. Um, and the adjustment during this was managing all this, you know, new life um, people ringing that haven't rung for a long time and people leaving casseroles and um, people not ringing us when we thought they would and all that stuff going on. There's a busyness and getting through treatment. Um, and so this is a quote for someone who was on chemo. She said, it was just awful. It was as bad or worse than I ever expected it to be. Each time you have a dose of chemotherapy, it takes longer for your body to get better. I just couldn't really see it, see it ending. And another one said, during treatment, you're in go forward mode. I didn't stop to think about what was really happening to me. Now, this was 20 years ago, and we are, a, we are better at managing um, side effects, but there are still lots of people who that's their experience. And then treatment finished. So they talked about they went from cancer patient to not really sure what to call myself. And everyone has a different way that they would say, oh, hi, I'm a cancer survivor, or I am someone who had cancer, or I'm... You could think about how you would describe yourself if you finished your treatment. And the experience of it was absolutely relief. Thank God all of those appointments are over. But suddenly it's really mixed with ambivalence um, and fear. And this was when they started to process what happened, which is why they were crying and being panicked and coming, um, being referred to see me. So the adjustment was, it was adjusting to this kind of whether they had new values and new life um, expectations, 
and constructing a new reality. Who am I now? Am I going to get back to normal? Is normal something different now? I've got to actually work all of that out. Um, so there's a bit of looking back and appraising what happened and then looking forward. And of course, what happens at this point is that everyone else has gotten on with life. So the treatment team has gone to the next person that's just been diagnosed. That's where their focus is. You don't have appointments going in you know, regularly. Um, and family are going, oh, God, thank God, we can get back to normal. And you're going, it's only just hitting me. Now, there's a reason for this, and it's, it's how human beings manage trauma. So if you read any account of someone who's been <clears throat> lost in a desert, been through terrible abuse, been in a terrible car accident, going through um, a cancer diagnosis and treatment, what they will say to you is, when I was in the middle of all of that, I couldn't process it. You can't, because you're just you're surviving. And so once the threat of that is largely over in that moment, that's when it hits you, because you can start looking at it. And that's why that's the time when we need to be acknowledging that there's an adjustment phase afterwards. There's a recovery phase that we need to be just naming and going, yep, of course, that's where you're at now, and let's help you through the recovery. Because you do get through it, but if you think, what's happening now? So a couple of um, quotes when treatment finished. Claire said, I can do cartwheels down the street. Gail said, I told my doctor, doctor, that's it, I'm not coming in here anymore. It was just really great. But then another, <clears throat> Annie said, whereas at the time of going through treatment, the time of being operated on and having all of that, it was a time when I didn't really think I ever really had cancer. Looking back, it was a bit unreal, whereas now it's becoming real. Um, and that doesn't surprise me at all that she said, I didn't even think that I had cancer. What she's saying is I didn't even let myself take that on because I was surviving. Um, that I don't read that and go, oh my God, that person is in complete denial. I go, yep, of course, that's how you got through those days. And now it's, now it's kind of hitting you and now it just needs to be processed. So it's hard to process a trauma when you're in the middle of it. That's the message I want to give you. Um, and often it's once the initial crisis is over that you start to process it. And that's okay, and you, you can get through that, um, really with lots of positive things. But unless we actually name it and support people through it, I think we just set people up to feel like they're not managing. Now, of course, um, we don't experience life on our own. And I really believe that when someone is, gets a cancer diagnosis, the whole family gets a cancer diagnosis. And I use the term family very loosely, as someone who has heaps of different family and they live in my house. Um, it can be extended family, it can be friends, whoever's in your, um, your tribe of people. Um, and so what happens if you look at this um, mobile, which also looks a little bit like a family tree, which is why I use it. Say the blue piece is the person with cancer. So it's all hanging there and it's balanced, and I come along and I flick it. Everything moves. Some bits might spin around, some might get tangled, some might just move a little bit. Everything moves. Um, and we really should be going, OK, this has happened to this family. It has come through the door of this house. What does everyone need? Because we don't do that, we have fantastic partners who are just trying to deal with everything without any support. We have kids that don't know what's going on. We have people that are living with cancer feeling like they have to hold it together for everyone. So, you know, we do a disservice in that. There's definitely, we know, an impact on children, especially when we don't tell them what's going on. Um, and I know, um, I have lots of little people in my life, everything in you tells you to not give them bad news and make it be all okay and say something really lovely that it's going to be fine. And yet what we know is that that does such a disservice to kids um, because they actually need to know what's going on and they need the respect and they need to know they can ask questions and then they go, oh, okay, I'll go and play footy now. Um, and then they come back and they ask the next question. It's only when we all whisper or we stop talking or we only tell them a little bit that they go, something really bad is happening here. We know that partners, so I'm using this as 
um, a partner or a best friend or whoever's really closely connected to you have as much stress, if we could put a number on it, as the person with cancer. It's usually different. They have different needs, they have different information needs, but it is up there. We've measured in, in lots of studies with the person that has cancer. Um, they have a different experience, but are equally as stressful. And one of the reasons is, I think, because we just expect them to carry all of this and not even tell them how that might, they might be able to do that. Um, the other thing is friendships. Now, I'm not going to ask you to put your hand up, but I have done that before and I've seen lots of hands. Almost everyone tells me that there is at least one person that they were sure would have been there if something bad happened. Could bet my life on it. If something happened, that would be the first person. They would ring me, they'd come and see me, they'd take me, whatever, and they weren't. People also say to me that there were people in their life that they didn't even think twice would be there for them, who stood up and was there. And that is big and it's beautiful and it's painful and it is life, um, but it's another thing that we, done, that we cope with. Let me get it on here. So friends um, may not be able to deal with um, um, their helplessness in the situation. There's a whole lot of reasons why people just cannot manage it. It doesn't make it any easier, but there's, you, you know, often good reason. Um, they want to avoid it and they just don't want to hear about your feelings and your cancer. And you, therefore, don't need them around you at the time. You actually need people that can be there for you um, and allow them to do them. <coughs> Excuse me. I'll just skip over this one. And what is important is that we embrace the people who rally around us during this tough time and we say we're really grateful for those people and we're grateful that um, of our reflection in their eyes, that we're actually cared for, because um, these are the things that get us through. But of course the really big thing is that we now have to live with uncertainty. And actually all of us kid ourselves that we have control over tomorrow. Um, it's just a human thing, it's because that's what keeps us kind of this equilibrium. Um, when you get a cancer diagnosis, suddenly you go, guess what, I don't. Um, it's the truth of all of us, but it, you cannot get away from it. Um, and so living with uncertainty is the trick, is working out how do I do that. So that bridge I talked about, it's about going, okay, I don't know what's on the other side. I don't like that, not happy with that at all. And of course, there's a real fear of recurrence. Um, that happens, and of course there is, because you were going along and thinking everything was fine and suddenly you were told that you had a cancer growing in you and you had to have treatment and it was really scary. Of course you're going to then go, I don't know when that's going to happen again, is it going to happen again, what's going to happen next? Um, so what can happen is we can be, become really hypervigilant about every ache and pain, um, or we can get scared and not want to ask the doctor to look at anything. A whole lot of stuff can happen. On the whole, that's just a really normal experience. Um, it's good to talk about it. It will pass. And if it doesn't pass, then it's useful to maybe get some help on some strategies about how to manage that. But I want to give you a couple of things that, that might actually help. So the anxiety that comes with uncertainty comes when we have uncertainty mixed with powerlessness. So the answer to it, even though uncertainty about what's going to happen in the future is a reality, and actually no one can give you that answer, but what you can do is say, what can I take control of? Now, it might not be easy to see. Um, so this, there is a second staircase. Is that obvious even from a power? OK. Um, this looks like a really simple um, slide, and I can tell you it can be life-changing. So what happens when we get panicked or when we have that rumination, often happens when we're trying to go to sleep at night or when we've got a bit of time on our own or when we're driving in the car, um, we start thinking and we go, well, what happens if this happens? And am I going to see this thing or am I going to do that thing I was going to do in the future? If we've got little people around us, are we going to see them grow up? We, and we go, oh, our imagination goes crazy. 
Or we're told that we need to start a different treatment and we go, God, I can't get my head around another treatment. It's all, so it gets all big. When that happens, we have to shrink back to that one step. My, my daughter's just found out she has to have that surgery where they break your jaw and move it forward and all that sort of stuff. And she's got to have two years of, she's 23 to, and a singer, um, two years of braces first. And she was just going, you know, I've got to have two years of braces and then I've got to have this and I've got to have the surgery and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, let's go right down to this. What's the next appointment we need to have? And then if we need to have braces, we deal with braces. And then when we need to do the next thing, we deal with the next thing. Because we can, that's what we can manage. So even when we might have the worst news possible, we still can go, okay, but I know it's going to happen today and I actually am going to stop myself thinking beyond this moment or this week or this month because as soon as I start going further, that's when I start to worry about stuff I have no control over, so I'm going to shrink it back. Um, it does really work and you start to do it um, naturally, but you have to just really talk to yourself about, no, no, I'm not going to go there. I'm going to come back to that, that one step. Um, speaking about people from Tasmania, I'm going to use some images. So this is Aurora Australis, which I have yet to see. How many in this room have seen Aurora Australis? Good on you. You'll have to tell me how you do that. One day, one day I will see it. Um, so, first message is decide on what time frame you can cope with and only focus on that. KP, in your absence, I'm just talking. I don't even know how long I've got, but I'm going. I'm sorry, I had to go yeah, That's okay. deal with the media and now I've dealt with a policy issue and I have to blow everything up. But anyway. oh, no, that's okay. But as I say, no idea how I'm going, but I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> so, that's the first message. Now, the second one is... Um, and this is a terrible slide of it, I should have used a better one, is to learn how, when situations happen and we think a certain way, that, is, that triggers how we're feeling and what we do. And there's a way to go back and try and stop how we think a certain way and that then changes all the feelings. So let me give you a better example of that. So I'm going to give you an example of um, someone that you like says something negative about you gets back to you. Um, the thought might be that um, I'm no good, I'm not likeable, I've got no friends. So that's a grandiose, all or nothing thinking. But often we can, we kind of have that thought. And, oh, sorry. And uh, then, because of that, we start to feel really down and hopeless and not wanting to go out. We might feel a bit sick in our stomach. And what we end up doing is maybe avoid a few social situations. That is all because of that original thought. If you can start to learn how to challenge what is, what is termed automatic negative thoughts. So they are the thoughts we have when we go, oh no, it's all, nothing's going to go right. Um, and I'll give you some other examples. You can shift all of that anxiety. Um, let me give you some examples of common automatic negative thoughts that happen when you're experiencing cancer and see whether you recognise any of them. So the first one is black and white thinking. And that's when you see things in extremes. So I'm either going to be cured or I'm going to die. It's nothing in between. It's black and white. One thing's going to happen or the other. Overgeneralising. So viewing one negative event as indicative of um, your entire life. So the example that I've got here is my husband spends so much time taking care of me, I'm so weak and I'm a needy person. That's just overgeneralising. Discounting the positive. So discarding positive experiences despite of the evidence. So my test results show that the treatment's working, but I think the cancer will probably return. Mind reading. A lot of us do this with our partners. Um, assuming others' thoughts and intentions. So my friend hasn't called me to see how I'm doing because she doesn't care about me anymore. Might be a whole lot of other reasons, but we don't know. And then should statements. I heard a couple of shoulds this morning in the panel. Um, directing yourself or others with unrealistic shoulds. I should not burden my friends or in family or ask for help no matter what. I should be grateful because treatment worked. No. No, it turned your life upside down. Yeah, it's great that the treatment worked, but actually this was not, not a, a happy thing to happen. When we have these 
these are, these are unhelpful thoughts. They change how we feel. So I'm going to give you um, a couple more examples. So a situation might be that you are called in for a repeat blood test by the hospital. They tell you it's nothing to worry about. Yep. Um, you think to yourself, thank you, um, that's it. I knew it was worse than I had been told. The treatment isn't working. So that's the automatic negative thought. Don't have a whole lot of evidence for it, but you go, oh my God, they're telling me it's all fine, but they're not telling me the truth. What happens because of that is you start to feel restless. You know, you're having a good day and suddenly now you've got a headache and you're feeling panicked, um, heart, heart's racing, etc. And an action might be that you cancel coffee with your friend, call someone to pick up the kids from school and go to bed. Okay. An alternative, and this is, I know this is not realistic, but I want to show you how it shifts depending on how you think. So you're called in for the repeat blood test, and your thought is, I'm so grateful that the hospital um, is thorough and uh, checks that my, double checks my blood, I'm glad that there's nothing to worry about. I'm not suggesting any of us would necessarily do that, but it would shift everything if we did. So you get happy, you go, wow, isn't it great, I'm really being looked after well, um, you're Oh, there you go, you, you actually feel fine. <laughs> That's the wrong thing. And then you enjoy coffee with your friend and take the kids to the park. Um, so what we're suggesting is that instead of um, going from <clears throat> the automatic negative thought, <clears throat> excuse me, and then going down the rabbit hole, so now I'm in bed with a headache and I don't want to talk to anyone, you have that thought and you start to feel panicked and you go, hang on a minute, I'm going to challenge that thought. What evidence do I have that the fact that they're ringing about this um, is a bad thing? Some of it might be, you know, they've never done this before, but I'm going to challenge that thought because I'm going to, I want to calm myself down. And then you might choose some different actions. So you might actually call them back and say, I know you told me it was all fine, but actually it's really worrying me. Can you tell me more about it? Perhaps just do it if, if that's what helps. Um, you might do some relaxation to calm your thoughts down. You might go for a walk. Um, you might uh, call that friend and say, can we have an earlier coffee? Something's just happened and it's thrown me. We're, this is how we start to take charge of these um, uncertainties. Remembering that you can choose to focus on what you can control and let go of the things you can't control. I have to tell myself this all the time. You know, I'm so worried about A, B and C. Well, I can't do anything about B and C. I'm going to focus on A and do it. And I'm going to go, B and C are happening. Here we are. That's how it is. Um, it is important, and I won't read through all of this, but sometimes emotional distress that comes isn't just simply thought away or change with cognitive steps. So sometimes... Um, the emotional distress that we feel is a very normal response to an abnormal, scary situation. And what I can tell you, just as a really quick message, we know how to treat anxiety, we know how to treat depression. There are things we can do, there are solutions to it, so go and ask for help. Don't feel like, oh, I'm feeling a bit down, but I can't bother anyone about it. Actually, there are things we can do, so don't sit with some of that emotional pain. Where can you get support? And then I'm just going to finish up. So um, in Tasmania, there is limited support, but we do know that there are some really useful places that you can go. And sometimes a very small proportion of people actually will benefit from getting a referral to a psychologist. And if, you, if we can't find one, as we often find, certainly in Launceston, it's really hard to, to get into one these days. Um, I can tell you, I think the online ones actually work really well. I think that is something that we have learnt. So if you need to find someone in the mainland who has some expertise and there's a way of doing that with a mental health plan, go really try those things. But the Cancer Council of Tasmania have you know, support centres. They have one in Devonport, one in Launceston, one in Hobart. And if you go in there and just go, I don't even know what I need, um, they will give you a list of things that are going on and it's a really good first step and sometimes it is just about what I've tried to do this today and that is normalising how you're feeling, going, yes, of course you feel like that. It's understandable, it's going to pass, this, these things might help. 
Um, or they might be able to put you in touch with others. So it's about actually asking for those things. We know there are McGrath nurses across the state. We know there are other breast nurses across the state. There are social workers in the hospitals. We know there are limitations on all of these services, but there are services that we should be at least trying. Um, and my final message is that um, if we can identify the things that bring us meaning, um, so it could be, uh, you know, I grew up on Turner's Beach, walking onto Turner's Beach shifts everything for me still, and I forget sometimes to do that. I need to remind myself, those things give me meaning, and, and even if things are really hard in life, I need to make sure I get in the car and go down to the beach. So whatever it is, um, feeling that you, you matter and you belong to people and focusing on what's meaningful really buffers any difficult thing in life. And we've known this since the existentialists started talking about this many years ago. So I'm talking about the pursuit of what, what we would call little ordinary meanings. So it is about the fact that we, you know, if you live in Launceston, we have the most incredible gorge, cataract gorge. I don't go there enough. Probably none of us do. It is a really sacred place. It is a beautiful place. We need to remember to actually go and just walk in, in those places. Um, so it might be a fascination with nature. It might be doing what you love, which could include stage diving like this guy, or <coughs> horse riding, or sitting and reading with books, or whatever it is for you, but doing what you love. You damn well deserve to do what you love. Kindness, we know when we are in a raw place, kindness, gosh, it's very loud. That's a really beautiful thing. Um, the simple beauty in the world. And of course, connection, which we hope to have done a bit of that today. Identify what brings you meaning and have more of that. That doesn't take away the suffering, but it balances things better. And sometimes we just focus on all the bad stuff. If we can add some of those other things, it balances it and it makes it a bit easier. And I will make this my last slide, that um, courage does not always roar. Sometimes courage um, is the quiet voice at the end of the day saying, I will try again tomorrow. That's all that is required of you. And some days you go, I really kicked at this today and it was great and good things happened. And some days you go, you know what, didn't get anything achieved, but um, it's the end of the day and I did enough. Um, so we don't always have to be full on brave. And I'm going to jump through this next one because it's just the take-home messages of what I've just said. Oh, thank you.